take the Bible, look over the book of Joshua with me tonight, Joshua, and I'm going to mention several other verses here and there, but if you want to follow along, you can. We'll be in Joshua chapter 7, and actually a couple of verses in Joshua 6 and chapter 7. The story in Joshua, of course the children of Israel have left Egypt across the Red Sea. They spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and because of a foolish mistake at a place called Kadesh Barnea, they could have gone into the Promised Land within a matter of weeks of when they left, came left uh, Egypt. But because they were rebels, self-willed, did it their own way, they wandered for 40 years and they missed the blessings that they could have had in their life. Amen. 40 years passed, that generation, everybody 21 and older dies, and the younger generation grows up, and now they're crossing the Jordan River, and their first battle is in the city called Jericho, and most of you are familiar with the stories. Uh, the story itself is not our lesson today, but it's a good place to start. So let's stand for a moment. We'll read the scriptures. Joshua chapter 6 with me. We'll read a couple verses there. And then Joshua 7. Joshua chapter 6. Now John Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, Go round about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. And he began to describe, you're going to go around the city each day, once a time, once a day, and then the last day, you go around it and uh, shout, and the walls are going to fall down. Turn over to chapter, or, I'm sorry, to verse 20, and then we'll go to chapter 7, verse 20. So the people shouted, and the priests blew with the trumpet, and it came to pass when the people heard the shout of the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout, but the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Now before we go on, not the sermon also, but notice, God didn't knock the walls down until the people did what he'd asked them to do. Right. Obedience does matter. And don't wait for God to act. You do what God's asked you to do, and then you can wait on God to act. Chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmine, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now God got mad because they violated some things. They go to Jericho, to Ai. In verse 2, And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven on the east side of Bethel, and spake, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people go uh, to labor thither, for they are but a few. Let's pray. Help us today, Lord. One thought tonight that would perhaps save a child, a marriage, a future, a destiny. And we ask, Lord, you'd help us tonight with these simple things that we might have a future that would please you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You'll keep your Bibles open there and look at a couple of verses. Most of you know the story. Great victory in the city of Jericho. Uh, the walls fell down flat and a wonderful, wonderful victory was wrought. They're celebrating. Understand, these people have been slaves. They weren't soldiers and warriors. They traveled for 40 years. They were hardened. They got strong. They, they built up the warrior mentality in a sense. And they did have some battles toward the end of the 40 years. And now they crossed over and they had seen on the other side Og, the king of Bashan. And there was a couple of battles over there. They, they, God was preparing them. But to see God do such a miracle, the walls fell down right in front of them. And they go in, win this great battle. And, and men are arrogant, let's be honest. They're arrogant. We get so proud. And when something goes right, we take the credit. And isn't this great? And, and uh, wow, we're just so blessed to have this. And we go, we know God did it, but we get pretty arrogant about it. And uh, they get so uh, overwhelmed with victory. There's a little town over there, and they get some information, just a little place. And so they go ahead, and Joshua says, just send two or three thousand. 
Just go take them out. We are going to whoop everybody. It's not a big deal. We can do this. Well, they, they couldn't do it. Let's look at the next couple of verses in chapter 7. Verse 4, there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them, about 30 men, 30 and 6 men. So 36 people died. They just beat an enormous city, Jericho, without a casualty. Now they go to this little village, 36 men die. For they chased them from before the gate, even, and to Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Uh, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water, and Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord. And to the eventide, he and the elders of Israel put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we've been content to dwell on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? Now, many of the people of God have come to a point in their life where they went into a situation and everything fell apart. And they go to God and say, God, what's going on? Just like they did at Ai. Now, there are battles we're all going to face, but there are battles that we can face differently. And tonight, that's the line you want to draw. You may not be able to change the battle that you're in, but you can change the battle plan. You may not be able to change the fight you're going to have to fight, but you can change the outcome of that fight. In 1 Thessalonians, to keep your Bibles here, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 is our text verse. Three words, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. In Luke 18, 1, Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Not pray on Sunday. Not pray when you're in trouble. Pray always. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, I read before, pray without ceasing. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 12, it says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Instant, always, every situation that comes up, pray. Have you prayed? Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray in the name of Christ our Savior? Did you sue for loving favor as your shield today? Prayer is that, that uh, instruction manual in every area of life. Have you ever tried putting something together and you go through all the details and, and you look at it and think, oh, I can do this. And you start putting it together and putting it together. And then you realize that this part had to go on before all these parts. And now you've got to take all these parts off to put this on and then to put these things back on and you're frustrated. Well, it's your own stupid fault. You didn't read the instructions. And I've done it and most of you have done it except the women because they know enough to read the instructions. The only reason we have marriage trouble is because there's no instruction manual. Otherwise, well, yes, there really is girls. Come Friday, Thursday night and Friday, we'll talk about it, about marriage. But here in Joshua... A very familiar story, but a sad one. In fear and trembling, they crossed the Jordan River. They knew they needed God. A great walled city lied before, before them. They knew they needed God. They prayerfully made their plans, and they diligently obeyed God's direction, and they saw a wonderful victory. They saw another city. It wasn't intimidating. They could do this. Why, we just had a great victory over this massive city. That town won't be any problem at all. But we need to understand, it's not the size of the enemy that causes us to win or lose. It's the presence of God that causes us to win or to lose. So I've had three children, and everything's been fine. And you don't even think about praying for this fourth one. And then you get them, and you wonder who the father is. And this child is hard-willed, stubborn, uh, obstinate, just like their mother, or whatever. <laughs> if we're not careful, we'll get so arrogant that we think we can do things without God. 
In Psalms chapter 20, verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, the important thing is just that word, remember. You're going to get up in the morning, and you're going to go to work. Some of you, hopefully all of you. Will you remember God? I rarely, one of our men's had some truck driver had some truck problems. Rarely do I pass a semi that I do not pray for him. Now, let me just be honest. It's not my problem. But it'd be good for the person with their own battles to pray. I rarely will pass a policeman without praying for a policeman. Well, if I'm praying for the police, maybe the policeman ought to pray. We just throw this in as an absolutely unrelated thought. We were at a place called Culver's. If you've been in the Midwest, the South, they have Culver's. Somebody needs to get a Culver's in California. Amen. You'd never go back to Cold Stone if you could get a Culver's. Frozen custard. I mean, I'm a Cold Stone fan. You want to give me a gift card, Cold Stone will do just fine. Give my wife something gooey like Cheesecake Factory, but uh, Cold Stone far surpasses that. But we're standing there, and, and two policemen, first one policeman, and then another came in a few minutes later. I've got a line of it, it's almost eight or nine of our young people there, and, and I'm waiting for them all to order, and this policeman comes up and goes next the next cash register. And as he's getting near the end of his order, I just walked over and asked if, I could be, if it would be all right if I paid for his lunch. And he stopped, and he said, well, you need to do that. I said, no, I don't need to do it. I said, I would be honored if you'd let me. And he said, well, I'll be fine. So I trying to keep up with what's over there, but I paid over there, and he thanked me and went and sat down. Well, then we're about done with our group, and then another policeman came in that was with him, but they were, they were for whatever reason, under the same time. And, and, um, and I thought, honestly, this is just foolishness. I thought, I'll bet these guys never buy me. I bet they never, I bet they never have to buy me. I bet everywhere they go. Because I, I, not long ago, uh, I was out of a Circle K or someplace just getting something, gas or whatever, and I saw a policeman just at the coffee pot getting a cup of coffee, and I said, I paid for whatever I was paying for, and, and I just laid a $5 bill down. I said, could I buy his coffee or whatever it is he wants? And, and the, the gal said, well, you can, but he gets it for free. <laughs> I said, we, we give police anything that they, we have any coffees or whatever she said. And I just assume that's what we do to our law enforcement. Right. The second one came in, and, and uh, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I said, hey, would you mind if I paid for that? And he said, well, that would be fine if you'd like to do that. And I, so I put my ATM card down there, and, and he said, it's kind of an unusual thing. It didn't happen very often. And I almost cried. People put their lives in the line every day. <clears throat> when you have a problem, you dial 911. <clears throat> and what are we thinking? And for him to say that was an unusual thing really bothered me. We ought to be, we ought to be loving on people. Look, young people, you ought to love your parents. Um, and all of us, a fireman comes by. My goodness, who's putting your house, the fire in your house out? Why, do we, why are not, we not good to people? We're crazy. We're, we're just crazy to not nurture and take care of those people that we depend on. And I, I think you ought to write thank you notes to your doctor if he's a good doctor. And I've got a new dentist, and he is terrific, and the office staff is good, and they take care of me. And the, the gal at the desk said, now look, uh, these other things need done, but not right away. And if you wait till January, you're, it'll kick in different on your insurance. She knows my insurance better than I do, and she's telling me when to do what, so it'll save me money. I like her. <laughs> Most dentists would just say, hey, come on in for the next thing, next week, or whatever. And I'd have to research all this stuff. We're crazy anyway, that's a sideline. But it's not a matter of the size of the enemy, but the presence of God that matters. As a church, as well as individuals, we need to understand that it is no accident things go right. Some young person comes along and and um, they're going to get married. And I've said this before. I'll say it over and over and over. Uh, my wife and I, before we got married, memorized dozens, perhaps a hundred verses on the tongue. We needed God's blessing on our marriage. Now, 
if you're getting married and you don't spend time getting God's direction, you're going to misplace the pieces. You're going to have to take off piece A and put piece B in place because you didn't follow the directions. When we got married, we got to this resort at Lake Shasta and got on our knees in that hotel room and prayed that God would, in fact, we read through a bunch of these verses we've been memorizing. And on our knees, on our wedding evening, we asked God to give us that kind of marriage. What are we thinking? Not going to the God, to the God who made the stars. Not asking for his help. Not seeking his direction. It's exactly the problem that Joshua and his people were facing. They won a great battle. They saw a little enemy. But understand, you can die from a spider bite as well as getting stomped on by a herd of elephants. We need to pray. That child, we physically will do everything in our power to care for our children, where they go, who their friends are, who looks after them, and where they are when we're out of town or whatever. And I'm for babysitters, and I'm for, I'm for husbands and wives dating. I started out saying, nobody's going to babysit my kids. It's just going to be us. We're going to be a family. And after a few years of marriage, I realized, you know, my wife needs to stay close, and kids are a big wedge. Because I want the attention that brat, I mean, that lovely child is getting. And um, we picked very few, very selective people to watch our children, but we did it. And I'm for that. I believe it's helpful. I believe it's a good thing. But whatever you do is up to you. But, I, but it would be very foolish to, to put my children with the right people and to put my children in the right schools and put my children in the right places and not pray for them. I, I don't know. I'm sure there's been a few days in the years of our kids 20 to 30 years of life that I've not prayed for them, but they would be rare. I've got a list of things I pray for for our children. One is that they'd see, that they'd hear, the hearing eye and the see, the seeing eye and the hearing ear, the Lord made both of them. I want God to make them see. I want God to make them hear. I want God to open their heart up so that they'll understand. I got, want God to put a hedge around my children. And if we're not praying for our kids, who cares what school you throw them into? God's the one who's going to protect them. Amen. I think God have them in the right school. I think God have them around the right friends. Look over to chapter 6. If we did not, I'm sorry, chapter, chapter 7, if we do not pray, what in the world are we thinking? Chapter 7, we read a minute ago in verse 6. Joshua rent his clothes and he fell upon to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord. And you know what he's praying now. But when did he pray? He prayed when things went wrong. How much do we pray when the marriage is falling apart? How much do we pray when the relationship is on the rocks or our child is in the hospital? How much do we pray when a wrong person led our child into a wrong situation? We pray. But how much do we pray before that happened? You go a little bit further. Down in verse 10, the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? It's your own fault. You're the one who got you here. You didn't ask. Most of you know the story. If you don't know the story, God had said, I don't want you to take anything in this city. I want it all offered to me in sacrifice. It's the tithe. It's the first fruits of the land of Canaan. Every animal, every piece of gold, everything that's wealth that's of any value is mine. You can have the rest of the nation, but I want the first city. A guy named Achan saw some gold, silver, some precious things. He grabbed them up, took them back to his tent put him in his tent, hit him there, went back, the battle's over, and understand it's a huge city, a giant walled city, chaos all over, people dying, fighting going on, and he managed to get his stuff to his tent, get back, no one but his family knew about it. That's not the issue. The issue is that next town, and Joshua said, God, I know that's a little city, but God, we're not doing anything without you. How do you want us to do this? Where do you want us to go? How do you want us to handle it? God would have said, don't go until you straighten this thing out. you got a problem. But because, because Joshua and the elders just took off on their own, because they knew what was right, they had a plan. They knew they could do this. Because they didn't pray over their direction, Achan's sin took away the blessing of God, and 36 men died. There were probably 36 widows that night because Joshua didn't pray. Right. There were probably 30 or 40 children who were fatherless because Joshua 
didn't pray. How much we need to pray. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. In everything. In everything we ought to pray. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints, always praying, always praying. Just think, this is Sunday, and of course you don't pray or read your Bible on Sunday. Can anything go wrong on a Sunday? I guess a lot could go wrong on a Sunday. Did it ever occur to you those kids in that class needed just the right lesson taught in just the right way. When I think this morning, Joe, who's been coming for so long and praying for his daughter, his daughter comes in for the first time. Oh, we want the right sermon. And nobody knows the right sermon except God. Now, we'd all agree, right? Don't you think the pastor ought to pray? All right, we're about to put the knife in your own heart. How many hours have you spent with your children today? That Sunday school teacher only got about an hour. How many hours have you had? You've had four, six, eight hours with your kids. Do you know how many things you could do right or wrong in a Sunday afternoon that would win the heart of a child or cost you their heart and we didn't even pray? We're crazy. No telling how many marriages are lost because somebody didn't pray. God, help me treat them right. Let me say the right thing. A dad on the way home, driving home from work, and he's going to face who knows what. He has no idea what his wife faced that day. No idea what his children would face that day. No idea what came in the mail. And he's driving home, and he's tired. And all I can think of, I want to get home. I want to sit in my chair. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. Right. I just want to collapse. Maybe you want to ask God. Well, how many people have gotten married and then had to pray and fast to try and salvage a marriage that started off everything wrong? Prayer. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, but the end of all things is at hand because they knew who was running for the White House. The end of all things is at hand. What does he say? Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The trouble with humanity is we forget too soon that we need God. Before your children get to school tomorrow, somebody ought to be praying for them. Before you young people get to school tomorrow, you ought to be praying. Hey, how many of you like to have your teacher be nice instead of a grump? Pray for that teacher. God, help him not be a grump today. Pray that, pray that everybody's happy. Look over to chapter 9 in Joshua, chapter 9. I, I, I just think we need to pray. We need to pray about where you drive and which way you drive. We ought to pray about which way you drive to church. There's two or three ways most of us could get here. Why not pray about what road to take? You say, well, that's a silly thing. I do it three times a week. Well, it wouldn't hurt to ask God. Amen. Maybe he knows. Wouldn't hurt. Look, I've, I've told this story. I try to keep old stories because then I don't get people mad at me. Many years ago, I was talking to a single mom, good lady. And she got saved, the kids had got saved, two teenagers in the house. And she, she was, one, the, the, the daughter was doing well, but the son was struggling. And she said, preacher, I don't know what to do. And we, we prayed, and, and um, she called me up one day, and it was an ongoing thing, and she called me up, and she's so excited. She said, you won't believe it, you won't believe it. I figured it out, because I figured out what's the, what it took to get through to my son. Her son was great at church, but a struggle at home. And I said, what, what'd you figure out? She said, I cooked dinner. I said, what? She said, I cook dinner. Which well, never occurred to me that you don't cook dinner. You know, you've got kids at home and a husband, and it's dinner time, maybe there ought to be dinner. She said, I work long hours. The kids are busy with all their activities before at a Christian school, all their activities, different schools. It's just kind of everybody eat whatever you want. There's always food in the house. She said, I cook dinner, sat down, he looked at me, and instantly I could tell something had changed because I cooked him. Maybe there's some little tweaking of that child or your spouse that prayer would reveal to you. 
I mean, I'm the pastor. I never thought of suggesting she cook dinner. <laughs> but, but I'm going to suggest it tonight, okay? How about this? Don't go home drunk. So why, why do you say that? I don't know. Maybe somebody needs that. It's not a good idea to go home drunk. It's not a good idea to get drunk. I'd suggest you not even drink liquor, but I never think to say that. So you know what I'm going to say? It. Stop it. No child of God ought to be drinking booze. The closest thing to booze you should have is night will. Don't go to casinos. Don't go to the theater. I am a, I've got a sermon I'm working on. I'm an adjective Christian. Independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, separated, haircut, tie-wearing, King James Bible. I got that's all. It's the whole. It's, a, it's an ad, I'm an adjective Christian. Got it. All right. Pray. You that are married, you'll get this. I hope you'll come Thursday night and Friday morning, Friday night, Saturday morning. But have you ever prayed over those delicate areas of your marriage? How about this? God, would you show me what I need to do to please my spouse? That prayer I would pray daily. Ooh, that's getting personal. Yeah, God's a big God. You know, what we do, what, we, what we're more likely to pray is, help my idiot spouse know what I need. That's not a biblical prayer. Now, Joshua 11, Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9, you know the story, but I'm going to read it. It's very familiar territory for most of you. God had made, before we read Joshua 9, God had told him, you take out the entire land of Canaan. There's a whole lot of reasons for it. But he said, get rid of all of them. Don't make any agreements with them. Don't make any covenants. Kill them all. That is your land. I don't want any, I don't want a picture left. I don't want a statue left. I want nothing of that world left. Get rid of The word is dispossess. He said, dispossess the land. Every possession of this land, get rid of it. Get rid of all of it. By the way, if you're struggling with things in your home, I'd suggest you dispossess your home. Get rid of every bit of worldly music. Get rid of every worldly picture. Get rid of everything that's connected to the world. Why? Because it's a string attached to your heart. You're like me keeping a picture of an old girlfriend. Probably not a good idea. Well, you know what? God looks at us, and there's your girlfriend, the Lakers. There's your girlfriend, Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Say, who's that? No, no, no. The Beach Boys. Your Elvis Presley albums. Burn them? No. Those might be worth money. Sell them. Put the money in the building fund. God says, I want it all gone. I want it all gone. I, want, I don't want you to have any relation with these people. And so, Joshua chapter 9. And look down at verse 11. Some people saw that they were a deadly people. In verse 11, Wherefore our elders and the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go meet them, and say to them, We are your servants. Therefore now make ye a league with us. This bread, they pulled up this old moldy heart bread. This bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. These bottles of wine which were filled were new, and behold, there we be rent, and these our garments and our shoes became, um, are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took of the victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Got to mark that verse. They asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And these people, they had lied, and they had come from Gibeon, just a few miles away, and they put on old clothes. They got old moldy bread. They got these old things on. They put dust on them, dust on their own camels, horses, whatever. And they came to three or four or ten miles, whatever it was, to Joshua and said, Hey, we just want to introduce ourselves. We're from so far away. We just want you to know we've heard what a great people you are. God bless you. I hope you have a great time conquering Canaan. We just want to be friends. Will you make a league with us? And they asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. One prayer. One prayer could have solved so many problems. Understand, if you want to look at history, we're in the book of Joshua. Then there's the book of Judges, 400 years. After Judges, you find Samuel, and then uh, uh, Samuel, and then Saul, and then David. 
and David is having problems 500 years later. That's longer than America's been around. <clears throat> David goes to God and says, God, what's the problem? Why are we being cursed? And God says, David, Saul was trying to kill the Gibeonites. And we made a promise to not kill them. 500 years earlier. Yeah. You're going to have to make those giving nights like you before I ever bless you again. David, hundreds of years later, is wrestling with political problems because he, not because he messed up, but because back here Joshua didn't pray one simple prayer. God, do you want us to be friends with these people? One simple prayer. Hundreds of years of grief. Look on a little bit further. It says, they asked not counsel in verse 15. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them and let them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation, that's the princes of Israel, swear to them. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. All oh, the grief, all oh, the grief that we face because we do not go to God in prayer. Our trouble is that we don't pray. Our second trouble is we get advice from the wrong people. Remember the story? I won't have you turn there. You know the story of Rehoboam, Solomon's son? Solomon dies. Rehoboam's facing a decision. Be good to these people, be a servant to them, or be a uh, taskmaster. He asked the old men. And the old men said, be a servant and they'll love you. He asked his friends. And they sat around there and they said, oh no, be tough, be strong. The kingdom was split and tragedy happened all because they were asking counsel of the wrong people. He should have been asking counsel of God and of the older men. But you know where preachers are today? It's amazing to me. Um, the young men. I've got a picture of a group of young men. I think the oldest probably 35, maybe 40 at the moment, probably in their 30s. And a group of preachers all sitting around, maybe a dozen or so, and they're talking about principles, and they have this meeting because they're going to talk about how to build churches and how to reach people and how to change life. Not one gray head there, not even a veteran pastor there. They're crazy. That's right. Hello. They're crazy. You young people here, you, you young men that are going to go off into Bible college, you've heard me, how many times have you heard me talk about Dr. Hiles? And Pastor Blue, I have lived my middle. This church is not a product of Bruce Goddard. It's a product of me hanging on to the coattail of men 20 and 30 and 40 years my senior because they've been there, they've done that, and they know what they're doing. Amen. Only an idiot sits around with a bunch of people all about to make the same decision to figure out. You know, you ever see six people that don't know how to swim talk about how to learn to swim? <laughs> crazy. They're just crazy. Maybe one of the saddest things this generation of young people has done is they've forgotten the seniors. I was in a car with a young preacher one day. I was amazed. He's probably 35. And he said, you know something that bothers me? He said, no preachers, none of the older preachers call and ask my opinion. He caught me so off guard. I didn't know what to say. I was driving. And he said that, he wasn't from our church, just so you know, but, but it could have been. He caught me so off guard, I, I just, it just jaw dropping. I said, what? He said, you know these preachers, they have these conferences, these older preachers, and it never occurs to them that we might have an opinion. It never occurred to any of us that we cared. <laughs> I didn't say it, I, I didn't, I just was so dumbfounded. Here you got a journeyman electrician or carpenter or whatever. Decades of work. And I'm the new guy on the job, and I've been there three years. And I want to know why don't you get my advice? Because you're an not here. That's right. Amen. Give me the old man. Yeah, they're overweight. They're wrinkled. And their hair doesn't stand up cute. <laughs> They may not even have any hair left. Right. What's wrong with this? Man, we got the Jeremiah Bohm Center. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. I love this verse. 
Isaiah 30, verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. Look over a few pages to 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel 28. You're in Joshua and the Judges in 1 and 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel 28. Samuel was the prophet, priest, that anointed Saul as a king. Saul got messed up. Here in 1 Samuel chapter 28. Saul had lost the blessing of God in his life because, bottom line, just plain old sin. He did it his way. He didn't go to God for direction. In fact, he'd been so bad, he disobeyed so much, God quit talking to Saul. Look there, if you would, at chapter 28, verse 7. And Saul said to his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit. That'd be our term for a witch. A palm reader. These things that they have around the place of the world, they're just as wicked and demonic now as they were in Bible days. Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And the servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me up, me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest that Saul hath done, she didn't realize he was Saul, how he hath cut off them, those that have familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. And the woman then said to the woman, Whom shall I bring up to thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Samuel is his counselor, his friend, the one who anointed him. Now, think about this. Two choices. He goes over here. He has his servants find this woman. He disguises himself. He brings guys with him, and he goes to this long charade to get this lady to bring Samuel up from the dead. Or he could just say, God, I've really messed up. Will you show me what to do next? Now, that seems pretty silly, doesn't it? But how many times have you or I gone to great lengths to solve a problem instead of prayer? How many times has the Holy Spirit said, maybe you ought to pray about that? And we did this, and we did that, and we did this, and then we did that. We got busy doing laundry. We got busy cooking. We got busy doing dishes. We got busy mowing the lawn and changing the oil in the car. We got busy playing Monopoly with the kids, which is a totally crazy thing to do. And the Holy Spirit's saying, uh, hey, have you prayed? Have you prayed? Say this, if you're married, you ought to pray for your spouse. You got to pray for you that you can be a good spouse. You got to pray for them. Pray for their day at work. Pray for their day at home. Pray for them when they deal with children. Pray for, uh, pray. But we get so busy doing everything but prayer. And prayer will smooth out these things so you can get things done more quickly. Prayer will help us over the humps of things. Prayer will allow us to see things that would go wrong so now they don't go wrong so we can get much more done in much less time. But we don't pray so we don't have enough time and we struggle and we argue and we fuss and we're grumbling and we don't like life and we don't like anybody else and they don't like us and it's all because we don't pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray about everything. What a mess Saul got to do. He was condemned. As a church, we have a big day coming. Some of you have been helped to a lot of big days. We're, I don't know, eight weeks or so. I don't know, maybe nine, ten weeks away from a big day. Sunday before Thanksgiving. We're going to go bring church to the community. Next Sunday night at 530, we'll meet here with everybody that can come. We're just going to talk about where we're going to go, what we're going to do, and how we're going to do it. But I'll say this, if we don't pray, there's no point in planning. Amen. If we don't pray, there's no point in gathering groceries. If we don't pray, there's no point in Look, as we get ready, you bus captains, you ministry leaders, you that have been involved in these things, start now in prayer. I've been praying. We have this couple's conference this week, and then another week away, our Sunday school clinic. We're spending a couple of days teaching on Sunday school work. 
right on my desk, I've got that Sunday school clinic flyer, and I pray every day. I pray and pray that God help us. Why? We need better Sunday school teachers. We need more Sunday school teachers. We all need to learn. We all need to grow. The song, Ere You Left Your Room This Morning, Did You Think to Pray? In the name of Christ our Savior, did you sue for loving favor as a shield today? When you met with great temptation, did you think to pray? By his dying love and merit, did you claim the Holy Spirit as your guide and stay? When your heart was filled with anger, did you think to pray? Did you plead for grace, my brother, that you might forgive another who had crossed your way? When the sore trials came upon you, did you think to pray? When your soul was bowed in sorrow, balm of Gilead did you borrow as at the gates, at the, at the games of day, pray. Dr. Howells used to quote the song, I met God in the morning when the day was at its best. And his presence came like sunshine, uh, like a glory in my breast. All day long his presence lingered, all day long he sailed with me, and we sailed in perfect calmness for a very troubled sea. I want to challenge you tonight. This is the, nobody sees how much you pray. You drink a beer, people know. You smoke a cigarette, people know. You go with the wrong crowd, people know, but nobody sees you pray. But I know this, if our church does not pray, we're in big trouble. You've heard me say it, you've heard me teach it. The first thing Paul told Timothy to teach the church was that the men would pray. I exhort therefore that first of all, first of all, the, the, you know the two most important things in this church, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, that the men learn to pray and the women learn to dress right. It's right out of the Bible. Eight verses Paul spends on teaching men to pray. And then the verse 9 is that the women would adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame, faces, and sobriety. You say, why? Because the ladies don't dress right, the men are going to be too carnal to pray. And if the men don't pray, we don't have God's presence. Come on. Uh, if I was to talk to some young men starting churches, I'd tell them, you better learn to pray, and you better teach your men to pray, and then you better somehow, little by little, teach this, this generation that boasts themselves of how few stitches of clothing we can put on ourselves and go in public, and teach them to be, to be modest. The prayer. Can I ask you to pray? I don't, I don't say this to chew anybody out. Because I don't know what you, how much you pray in private. But I believe our church would be a better church if we doubled and tripled the attendance at our men's prayer meetings. Right, yeah. I think our ladies pray on Tuesday morning. I'm not worried about our ladies praying. I think ladies pray because ladies are passionate. They want things fixed. Men are laid back. They just don't. Wednesday mornings we pray here around 7.30. Saturday nights we pray. And I think Saturday mornings, I think the men meet on Saturday morning and pray before... So morning, Saturday night, 7 o'clock we pray. If we had 30 or 40 men praying together, would it matter? Or does prayer matter? And again, I don't think you have to pray together. I just know this, if we don't pray, we're in trouble. We've been blessed just beyond measure. And I can't even begin to tell you the things that cross my path the miracle things that God is doing and has done around here. But if we don't pray, and specifically you men, if we don't learn to pray, we're not going to make it as a church. We will become a shallow, empty shell of a religious organization. Doing some good religious duties and having some young couples who hang around off and on, but really their life is going to be out of the world. But whether our young people stay living, hey, who's going to drive the buses? Ten years from now, when our bus drivers are in their 90s. Amen. <laughs> Who's going to be the bus captains? Who's going to teach Sunday school? <clears throat> Who's going to go to the jails and the rest halls? It's good, preacher. Come it's on. good. Somebody's going to pray down the heart of God on some young people's hearts. Right. Yeah. That's worked for 34 years, but we've got the next 34 years. Come on. I'm, I'm not ready to retire yet. I know this, we need people of prayer. Let's pray together. Help us, Lord. Remind